So, so, but just before we, we finish off, you've obviously had tons of business experience, life experience too. There's a couple of things that kind of resonate and stand out for me. You know, I'm sure there's, there's, there's millions of others as well. Um, but you talk about the importance of showing up and not living with regrets. Uh, what, what advice do you give to, to people in life and in business? I just, I mean, I was lucky enough to experience a person who was very close to me's life regret when I was young enough for it to sink in. And, uh, you know, it's a, a story that I was quite lucky that it went quite viral uh, when, I, when I told it. But it was a, a great aunt who had fallen in love when she was in her 20s and she'd met a person and then for circumstantial reasons ended up never seeing him again and splitting up. And just before I take her, took her to the home a few days before she died, she was crying and she was telling me, you know, I wonder what my life would have been like if I'd married Leslie John Moore. And I thought, sure, what a horrific thing. Like, I just never want to be sitting there uh, with my grandchild regretting stuff I didn't do. And even when I look back, like I've made terrible mistakes. So, like my life has certainly not been perfect, but I've tried stuff like and I, I, I've, I've given it a good shot. And at least the one thing that currently, I mean, there's certainly, I, I don't want you to think, you know, people have this kind of weird view. If you ask people, you know, if you could redo your life, would you do anything differently? And only an arsehole would say, no. Like, are you mad? I would start investing 20% of my paycheck from, you know, the day I started working. I would definitely <laughs> do that differently. If you didn't start investing when you're 18 and you have a chance to go back and not do that, you're, you're an idiot twice. Right, like, like there's, there's no doubt in my mind. I would have started investing earlier, uh, but you know, and I certainly do regret that I didn't do that. But it's fixable. You know, I can focus on getting that done now. I don't want anything meaningful. I don't want to regret not trying things. I'd far rather try something and fail it than uh, not try it. Because I talk about this idea that everything you say no to in your life, uh, at that point you say no to it, you're writing a check payable later in your life to regret. And I think we have to be better curators of our future self. I mentioned this earlier, but every decision you make, when you go to bed at night, I mean, you rip off your shoes. Like you just take off your, your, I came back from gym yesterday and I ripped off my sneakers. And then I quickly bent down and I untied the laces because future version of me, the woke up this morning, it has to, tie the, has to untie those laces. And I would rather give future me a better chance. And uh, I want to make sure, and, and it's future me that has to deal with the regrets of decisions that I didn't make and the decisions I make today. And I think you need to always sit there. Like, I want to keep a diary. I was hoping to actually start doing it this year. Uh, but every morning when I wake up and think, like, what am I committing to do today for future me? And um, what did past me, how did past me drop me in the shit today? You know, past me had that pizza for dinner. Like, and I know past me enjoyed it, but now present me has to work out twice as hard and has mm. to, you know, really not eat, uh, you know, eat very, very well today because past me was greedy. And there, there are these three versions of you, this past you, present you and future you. And you're, you need to be better, you know, you need to be a better relay team uh, for mm. yourself. And regret is a big part of that. And unfortunately, future future me is a person who has to cash all of those checks payable to regret. And I want to make sure that they have a, as close to a zero sum game to, um, to pay off later. You know, that South African philosopher, and I struggle to agree with him, but he, he's an, I don't know if the term is anti-natalist. Have you heard of the movement? I think so. Yeah, um, he was on another podcast. On another we listened. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, David, yeah. someone or other. Yes, he was with Jordan Peterson on the uh, Renegade Report. Did oh, you yeah. listen to that interview? No, it didn't. Not but that, we have no. heard him on another podcast, and he was quite. Right, so he basically believes that um, we would have been better off. The worst thing your parents ever did was had you. You'd be mm. better off because life is suffering, and uh, I think the first thing we had to you didn't prove well to me was that suffering is bad, because we, it seems like we pursue suffering. You know, people train for months and suffer uh, for, you know, an Ironman. And then they do the race and they have that moment of euphoria. Like we seem to be suffering machines. Like we, we seem to like it. But I do struggle with this idea, the idea that the end of your life is hard and often filled with regrets and difficulty. And often when people look back at their life, the whole thing didn't feel worth it. And I want to kind of do better. I want to I do my best to try and prove that guy wrong. I want to, no matter how much suffering there is there in my life, if I, you know, I have a painful death and things happen, I want to make sure that I do a good enough job to say, ha, you know, in my case, buddy, you were wrong. 
like I like I, I feel like I owe it to myself to to do the best I possibly can to say to him I'm glad my parents had me. And it seems like such a when you first hear him, you feel like, oh, this guy's a bit of a crackpot. And then you sit and you think about it a lot, yeah. which I have done. And I think, oh, there's a lot to be said for what he's saying. There is a, like, even in a good life, there's a lot of suffering. You know, you, sp- you spoke, uh, Craig, I think it was you earlier when you were talking about the privilege and the different lives we have. But life is shit for everybody. Like, and that's his whole hypothesis is that, you know, no matter whether you're born in a, in a small little shanty town in Africa, it's all you're always measured against your surroundings. Yeah. And, uh, and his hypothesis is that life for humans is, is difficult and hard and you would have been better off not having it. And um, it becomes actually difficult to prove him wrong. Uh, the average human life probably, you know, wouldn't be that great. Uh, uh, and you've got to work hard to prove a guy like that wrong. And I think I want to make sure I do. I love that. I think also, you know, knowing that it's going to be tough and it is going to be hard and you wake up kind of knowing that then it's fine. You're like, cool. Uh, little challenges. Cause every time you overcome a small challenge, you feel good. And so uh, if you've got lots of little challenges, you feel good actually a lot because you overcome them. And I guess there's some kind of weird thing that, like you say, we actually as human beings kind of uh, we just kind of gravitate towards uh, struggle sometimes, but Maybe that's what it's all about sometimes, and maybe it's not a bad thing. You know, at the end of the day, you 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 become a uh, this improved human being maybe on some level by going through tough times, and and maybe that's the value of the life. You know, so yeah, but it is a it is an interesting theory. I think that's what we are, right? I think we are problem solving machines. That's why I don't worry about AI taking over. People are like you know, what if AI is come and take over and they lose all of our job? We all lose our jobs. Well, so what? Right? It's not like we're here to work, right? Work is what we do in order to do other stuff. But what will happen is we'll do what we've done consistently throughout his history is we'll just solve something new. And there's always something like that's what we do. Like we, we, we chase conflict, we chase struggle, and we try to actively solve stuff. Like we, we, as a, the one thing that the species has never been as satisfied. And um, that's, that's an interesting proposition. And it, it does speak to this idea that we're, we're, we're struggling. We're constantly in some, we're struggling with something. And we're constantly trying to fix stuff and get better. And I think that's why I get excited about, you know, I love the idea. I think capitalism ultimately will be one of the shortest, it'll be a very important period of human history, but it'll be a very, very short lived one. You know, the true capitalism as we know it will exist for maybe, let's say we've got another 50 years running that way before we have to have some sort of universal basic income or something will make, uh, will kill capitalism as we know it. So you'll have this kind of two, 300 year period in, of history that will mm-hmm. just have been this significant in the, the switches it flicked and how it changed us. But I'm far more excited about what we start solving when, when we take that up, when we no longer have to worry about living, about paying the bills and you know, staying alive. What kind of crazy rad shit are we going to solve then? <laughs> mm-hmm. And, that, and, that, and there'll, there'll still be suffering. There'll still be all of those things. Everything will be consistent. But then we'll be solving really meaty, meaningful problems. And I'm so excited. And, you know, I, I would love to live to see some of that happen. Mm. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold Mountain.